So next is induction. Uh, seems like the next step to take. I'm sorry. I seem to have stumbled into a joke. Uh, my apologies. Although the joke should not be understood by you yet, perhaps by the end we will understand the joke. Um, lecture 5 is on induction. Um, essentially induction is based on a property of the natural numbers. So um, to, to really deeply understand induction, you should understand what natural numbers are. And um, well, what are natural numbers really? I don't know, I suppose we've known about natural numbers for a long, long time. Um, but uh, the formal understanding of natural numbers probably uh, is it's not too old, maybe 100 and, let's see here, 120, 130 years old, something like that. Um, but Piano, in 1899, gave a list of five axioms based on successors to describe the natural number system. And in particular, these were his axioms. One is a natural number. Every natural number has a unique successor. No two natural numbers have the same successor. And one is not a successor of any natural number. And five, if a set contains one and the successor of every number in the set, then the set contains n. In other words, the set is n. And uh, axiom five is also known as the principle of induction. So if we're going to try to prove a statement is true um, for, all, uh, for all natural numbers, basically what axiom 5 that Piano gave us says is that it suffices to show that that set contains 1 and that whenever you have a number in it, you've got the next number in it. That's, that's what we call a proof by induction. Um, but I give you many examples here, so if that seems fuzzy, don't, don't despair. Now once you have those five basic axioms, you can go on and you can, you can do more. And, and we will not prove this, but you may prove properties of the natural numbers that follow from those axioms. Like you can prove that the sum of any two nat natural numbers is a natural number, and that sum commutes. The product of any two natural numbers is a natural number, and the product commutes. Um, addition is associative. Addition, a multiplication is associative. You have distributi distributivity uh, either way, left or right. And um, you also have cancellation, like if x plus z equals y plus z, then uh, x equals to y. Um, that cancellation property is also something we know for, for even for vector spaces, but this multiplicative cancellation is pretty special. Um, that's only found in, in, in um, more, more specialized sets, but here it is. If xz is equal to yz, then x equals to y. So these are all familiar properties. But what's interesting, um, perhaps, is the claim that all of these can be derived from those five axioms, or the so-called piano postulates. And you also can derive um, these, um, sorry here, you should, well I guess we're okay. Other properties, um, order properties, you can show that uh, x is less than y, if and only if there exists a w such that x plus w equals to y, um, that x is less than or equal to y if and only if x is less than y or x is equal to y. Um, you get this transitivity of inequality, and if you have x less than or equal to y and y less than or equal to x, then we get equality. Um, so all of these can, and, and finally we have sort of cancellation, well not exactly cancellation, but uh, uh, transfer of inequality properties like additive or multiplicative uh, inequalities, old from, uh, new from old, rather. And um, all of these things can be defined in terms of that successor function, which, um, for what it's worth, you could build from the empty set and playing some games using empty sets, and then sets containing empty sets containing, and so forth. Um, and if you're interested in that, I'm sure there's a good Wikipedia article on it. And if you email me, if you can't find it, I'll, I'll help you find it. But. That's kind of really beside the point in here. We're not going to construct the natural numbers from basic set theory, um, but you could if you wanted to. Um, so we'll move on now. I just mentioned the above for logical completeness. Uh, our major goal in this lecture is to understand how to prove statements for all natural numbers. And basically there are three major techniques, all of which are in some sense equivalent um, in, a, in a logical sense, in an informally logical sense to um, uh, to that inductive principle for the natural numbers. 
I, I have to be careful using the term equivalence because people who are more careful about formal logic um, have have the game of when two things are equivalent is it's rather rather subtle. And um, for those of you who are more versed in informal logic and so forth, um, that that's a, a a deeper game to play. So when I say that these are equivalent, I just mean that we could we could prove strong induction follows from induction. We could prove that induction follows from strong induction. We could prove that strong induction implies the well-ordering principle. And, and these, these, we could interchange these. We could find proofs to get one from the other. Um, as long as we're working inside the context of the natural numbers that I just outlined. Um, OK, so um, induction, that's the sometimes called weak induction. The, the, the way it works is we show that the proposition all of these things concern a proposition which is either true or false for all natural numbers, all right? And um, so with regular induction, you show that the first case is true, and then you assume that it's true for n, show it's true for n plus 1. If you can do that, then proof by mathematical induction provides that p of n is true for all n. Strong induction, or sometimes called complete induction, you show p of 1 is true, and then you show that if the proposition holds for all numbers up to n, then um, you also get that, um, whoa, if, if that's a, I, sorry guys, I typo there. If you, if p of n is true for all n, um, Oh, oh, I'm thinking less than or equal to. I'm going to change that for less than or equal to because I just think it's, I just, I, I don't like that. I'm going, to, I'm going to trade that for a less than or equal to. It just makes more sense to me. All right. It wasn't a typo before. It just seemed unnatural to me. So if P of N is true for like 1, 2, da, 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 all the way up to M implies then that P of N plus 1 is true, then um, complete induction or strong induction says that it's true for all N. This technique is useful when you need to use something about the statement from different levels of M to prove the next one. Sometimes we need strong induction. And then there's the well-ordering principle that says every non-empty subset of the natural numbers contains a least element. So I, I will show you examples where all of these are used. Let's start with um, regular or standard weak induction, all right, which I'll just usually call induction, claim. The sum of 1 plus 2 plus da da da, da plus n is 1 half n times n plus 1. Um, there's a famous story uh, that when Gauss was a child, he, um, the, you know, the uh, school teacher asked them to add up the numbers from 1 to 100 to try, to try to waste their time, basically. And as quick as he'd asked the question, Gauss was like, the answer is whatever it was, I guess 5,050. Let's see here, 1 to 100. So 100 times 101. I think that's, yeah, 5,050. And um, so this is kind of annoying because it should take a child a while to add up the numbers from 1 to 100, but um, Gauss understood this formula implicitly as a child. In fact, Gauss um, was one of the last mathematicians to really know most of the forefront of mathematics um, at his time. He, he made significant developments in everything from number theory to differential geometry. Um, and, um, you know, had a deep understanding of where we were in all those things. So Gauss is an interesting figure. I'm sure you'll come across him many times in your math education. But um, in any event, here's a proof we can all understand. So we say that Pn is the claim that the sum of one numbers 1 through n is 1 half n times n plus 1. So the first thing we have to do is observe that the base case is true. P of 1 is true. Why is that true? Since 1 is equal to 1 half times 1 times 1 plus 1, right? In other words, I'm, I'm plugging in n equals to 1 into this and showing that, yeah, it works, right? So the next thing we do is we inductively assume that pn is true for some n in the natural numbers, all right? And then consider then that we can write 1 plus 2 plus da 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 plus n plus 1 as the sum of the first n plus n plus 1 just like that. But the green part by the induction hypothesis is just equal to the green part on the left-hand side is the, the green part over here is equal to the green part over there using the induction hypothesis, right? Because we're assuming inductively that Pn is true. 
and Pn is that this is equal to that. So great. And then you do algebra, right? And you combine it, and what do you have? Lo and behold, you've got one half n plus one times n plus two, which is you know exactly one half n plus one times n plus one plus one, which is the claim uh, written for n plus one rather than n. And so that proves that Pn implies Pn plus one. That, in other words, that verifies the inductive step. Therefore, by proof by mathematical induction, we find that the sum of the numbers from 1 to n is in fact 1 half n times n plus 1 for all n in the natural numbers. And that, my friends, is proof by induction. Um, now, let me share with you, you know, you might wonder, well, how on earth do you, you know, come to some sort of inductive claim? Well, there's various ways, but one way is just through uh, experimentation, right? So. Here's a, here's a good one, and I think I've ruined it by showing you the uh, after the light bulb, but I'll hopefully you forgot it by now. <laughs> so notice the following. 1 is 1 squared. 1 plus 3 is 2 squared. 1 plus 3 plus 5 is 3 squared, right, because it's 9. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 is 16, which is 4 squared. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 is 5 squared. And, um, you know, you might wonder how you come across these things. I don't know. Um, maybe you're on a long road trip and you tell your children to start adding odd numbers and see if they figure anything out and shockingly they figure something out you know who knows I don't, you, you can figure out the the story you want <laughs> behind why people were adding adding up the odd numbers to see what happens but suppose you did you might notice this pattern and once you notice that pattern you kind of you kind of see where you might make a claim that the sum of the first n odd integers is n squared and if we write that in a formula that says that the sum, and I'll, I'll define that sum uh, carefully in a page or two here, but I'm going to assume that we have uh, understanding of that sum already. Um, j equals, but I'll, I'll give you a careful definition of this before, before too long. The sum j equals 1 to n, 2j minus 1 is equal to n squared. So notice that this formula starts at j equals to 1, which is 2 minus 1, which is 1, and then when we plug in, plug in j equals 2, we get 2 times 2, which is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, so it, it, it works, you know. All right, so that's the claim. Now, let's see how to prove it. All right, do, 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 do. Come on, just a second, folks. Got a, my papers are coming, coming on down here. All right, so first of all, we prove the claim by noticing, first of all, the, the claim holds for n equals to 1, right? So we plug in sum j equals 1 to 1, 2j minus 1, that just means that this is one thing, it's 2 minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1 squared, therefore the claim holds for n equals to 1. All right? Now suppose that, you know, 2j minus 1, sum from j equals 1 to n is equal to n squared for some n greater than 1. In other words, we're making this inductive, uh, inductive assumption. So then we're going to consider the sum all the way out to n plus 1. Um, and when we do that, um, we get the sum j equals 1 to n plus 1, 2j minus 1. And then the way the finite sum is defined is actually, if we want to take the sum to n plus 1, we do the plug in the n plus 1th one here, and then add the sum from 1 to n. All right. And... Um, as such, we get this, right? But then, remember, the induction hypothesis says that that guy is just n squared, right? So then we've got n squared plus 2n plus 1, which if you do algebra, we realize is n plus 1 squared. So what that shows is that the claim is true, if the claim is true for n, we get that the claim is true for n plus 1, <coughs> excuse me, hence, by proof by mathematical induction, we, we conclude that the sum of the first n integers is n squared, for all natural numbers n. So I think that's kind of a kind of a neat example. Again, I'll, I'll circle back and talk more about the definition of finite sums here in a bit, okay? Um, but first, another kind of easy example, this one from calculus. You know the power rule, right? The claim is that the um, the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1 for all n in the natural numbers. So um, to prove this, we're going to assume a couple basic results from calculus. In particular, 
I'm going to assume that we know that the derivative of x with respect to x is 1, and also that we know the product rule. Those two facts suffice to prove um, the power rule by induction, at least for integer powers. Um, to prove this rule for non-integer powers, you probably need something like either the implicit, deriv di implicit differentiation or log differentiation, something like that. Um, okay, anyway. So let Pn be the statement that ddx of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. Number 1, base step, n equals to 1. ddx of x to the 1 is dx dx, which is 1, thus p of 1 is true. Next, the inductive step. Let's suppose that the power rule holds for n. And then we're going to consider that x to the n plus 1 is x times x to the n, which means that x to the n plus 1 can be viewed as a product. And um, as such, let me move it up here a bit, we can use the product rule, and then um, we can use the induction hypothesis, because remember we're assuming that that is n times x to the n minus 1, and then this times that gives me x to the n once more, so we've got x to the n, n times x to the n, so a little bit of algebra here, we get n plus 1 times x to the n, which is, you know, better looked at as n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1 minus 1. But that's exactly the claim for n plus 1 being true. So what we've shown then is that pn true implies pn plus 1 true. Hence, we find pn true for all n by proof by mathematical induction. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> Another example, we're supposed to show here that uh, 7 to the n minus 2 to the n is divisible by 5 for all natural numbers n. So divisible by, um, let me just uh, kind of skip to the bottom of this page here for a second, make sure we know what that means. So um, So divides by, we say a and b are integers, then a divides b. That's not like the fraction, this is a statement, a divides b, or a divides b, that's how it's read. That means that there exists k in the integers for which b is equal to ka. In other words, a divides b if and only if um, b is a multiple of a, right? b is a multiple of a. For example, 15 divides 75, since 75 is 5 times 15. On the other hand, 6 does, this is how we write, does not divide. 6 does not divide 10, since there does not exist an integer such that 10 is equal to 6 times k, right? If you could find that k, the k would be equal to 10 sixths, and 10 sixths is actually not an integer, right? It's, a, it's something else. Okay, so um, now that I've given you a crash course on what we mean by divides by, let's go back to the statement and look through the proof. All right, so in order to understand an induction proof, we first have to understand um, sort of the, the, the words being used, right? So here we need to understand divides by, or divisible. Okay, so show 7 to the n minus 2 to the n is divisible by 5. All right, so first of all, p of 1 is true since 7 to the 1 minus 2 to the 1 is equal to 5, and 5 is a multiple of itself. All right, so p1 is true. So we're going to suppose inductively that 7 to the n minus 2 to the n is divisible by 5. That would mean that there exists a k for which 7 to the n minus 2 to the n is equal to 5 times k. All right, but notice that 7 to the n is equal to 2 to the n plus 5k. And so we can calculate that um, 7 to the n minus 2 to the n plus 7 to the n plus 1 minus 2 to the n plus 1 is 7 times 7 to the n minus 2 times 2 to the n. But, um, so this is just, I've been, I've been trying to write the reasoning over here. Uh, it's just kind of a good practice. This is just algebra, a definition of power, really. Um, you know, if I have a to the um, n plus 1, it's equal to a times a to the n, right? Definition of power. And um, this here is by the induction hypothesis. We really should write that. It's important to uh, tell your reader when you're using the induction hypothesis. Hi. Um, which is 7 to the n is equal to 2 to the n plus 5k here. And then you notice that um, 
we can regroup. We've got 2 to the n and 2 to the n, 7 minus 2, right? And then 7 times 5k there. But thankfully, 7 minus 2 is 5. And so we've got this, and then we can factor out the 5. And we've got 5 times 2n plus 7k, which is 5 times an integer, right? Because 2 to the n plus 7k is an integer, which shows then that um, this is a multiple of 5, which is to say that 5 divides 7 to the n plus 1 minus 2 to the n plus 1, which is to show that uh, p of n being true uh, implies p of n plus 1 true, right? Hence, p of n is true for all n in the natural numbers by proof by mathematical induction. Okay, um, there are nearly endless examples I could give you, but I hope those suffice to get us started. Um, the other important idea, well, one of many important ideas here, is that um, induction is, is closely related to the idea of recursive definition. So um, a couple of things we run into a lot that involve recursive definition, well, one of them is, is the factorial, right? So the definition of factorial is that 0 factorial is 1, and that n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial for all n in the natural numbers. Um, so you could, you could start, you know, working it out. 0 factorial is 1, 1 factorial is 1 times 0 factorial, which is 1. 2 factorial is 2 times 1 factorial, which is 2. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 factorial, which is 6, um, because 3 times 2 is 6. And then 4 factorial is 4 times 3 factorial, which is 4 times 6, which is 24. Then you get 120, then you get 720, then you get 5,040 5, for 7 factorial. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Factorial um, grows, like, super fast, right? You probably remember that. You probably remember that from your Calculus 2 course. Right, um, but um, you may have also seen that n factorial is equal to n times n minus one times n minus two, dot 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 three times two times one. So when you see an expression like this, it probably is like um, there, there's really some kind of inductive idea underlying formulas like this. And so I can carefully prove that this formula follows from that definition. And here's the proof: um, n factorial is equal to n times that times n minus 2, times 3, times 2, times 1, for all natural numbers. So that's my inductive claim, in fact. So let Pn be the claim that n factorial is the product of the numbers from 1 to n, and observe that 1 factorial equals to 1, which is what this reduces to when we just have 1. So, great. Suppose Pn is true for some n greater than 1, and consider that n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial. That's the definition of factorial, right? But then, by the induction hypothesis, we know that this n factorial, let me underline it in red, this n factorial here is the product of the numbers 1 to n, right? That's the induction hypothesis. And so, what do we have? We have that Pn plus 1 is true, and the theorem follows by proof by mathematical induction. So, um, I know a lot of students get the feeling like we're just assuming what we're trying to prove here, but you got to pay close attention to the details. We're assuming that the statement is true for n, then we have to give arguments that show it's true for n plus 1. It's not just assuming it's true for all n. We assume it's true for up to a specific n, and then show that we can get beyond that. We can take the next step, that inductive step. Um, so just returning back to the finite sum again here, because I'd like to prove something about it. Now, I wanted to put this a little bit later in the lecture because it's a little bit, a little bit more sort of technical, but um, I think it's worth going over in here. So we informally often tell students that the sum j equals 1 to n of a sub j is like a1 plus a2 plus da da da, da plus a sub n, right? Um, which, I mean, <laughs> this isn't exactly a definition. It's really just trading one notation for another, and um, I, I think we just bully students into believing that that actually is a definition. And, and, and it might intuitively make sense, right? But to carefully define it, we probably should use some recursive recursion. And here's how you do it. Um, you say, say, jump j, sum j equals 1 to 1 is of a sub j is a1. And then you say that the sum j equals 1 to n of a sub j is a n plus the sum from 1 to n minus 1. Um, for n greater than or equal to 2, here's what happens when n equals to 1. Um, so 
we're defining the nth one in terms of the n minus one one. That's that's a recursive definition. But once you have that, once you have that definition carefully made, you can actually prove uh, the things we usually assume about finite sums pretty easily. Yeah, here it is. So the linearity of finite sums. If we have real numbers a j, b j, and c, um, of course a j and b j are infinite list of numbers in principle. Um, then um, the sum j equals 1 to n of c times a j plus b j is c times the sum of the a's plus the sum of the b's, just like that. So we can break up finite sums, so you can pull constants out of finite sums, just like so. So first of all, it's easy to show that well, we're going to let this be the, the inductive claim, all right? Something that depends on n and is, and is either true or false. That's the uh, induction hypothesis. Um, well, the inductive claim, rather. I should say the, the induction statement. Anyway, it's what I'm calling piece of n. And um, so check n equals 1. Uh, well, by definition, this is equal to the, the, this when we put j equal to 1, which is just ca1 plus b1. Um, but then I can say that's c times the sum j equals 1 to 1 of aj plus the sum j equals 1 to 1 of bj. And that's, I need this to be equal to that to get p1 true. So we have it. Next, we're going to inductively suppose that we have linearity for sums to n. And we'll take the sum from 1 to n plus 1 and break it into the n plus 1th term plus the sum from 1 to n. All right? But then I think you might know where this is going. We're going to use the induction hypothesis and break this up into that plus that because the induction hypothesis is that this can be, we have linearity for sums up to n. And then what you do is you take this term and that term, put them together, and this term and that term, and put them together like that, algebra. And because real number addition commutes and we can, uh, the distributive property of mul real multiplication, talk more about those in our, when we talk about the structure of real numbers, but by the way, the structure of natural numbers is part of that. So a lot of those terms I used at the start of this lecture are equally well going to apply to real numbers, of course, and it's not particularly surprising because, well, natural numbers are a subset of real numbers, right? Um, but anyway, and then by the definition of finite sum, what we have, and I'll, I'll just, you know, um, right here, this guy is that guy, right? That the book from there to there, uh, definition of uh, finite sum, and again here to here, again, definition of finite sum. So thus Pn plus 1 is true, and we conclude by a mathematical induction that the claim is true, that we have linearity of finite sums for for any n. So that's the, that's good to know. Um, now, next up, I need to build a lemma, um, and the reason I'm building this lemma is so I can share with you a proof of what's called the binomial theorem. All right, so I'm going to start with this this lemma and. Um, I guess I should, I, I should confess where it's coming from. Um, you probably have seen this before. I don't, I don't know. Probably you've seen it. Um, but let me just write it out for you. So you have 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, 1. Perhaps by now you see the pattern. Um, and so, essentially, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, this one would involve, like, um, if I can get this right, uh, three, um, three choose zero, three choose one, three choose two, and three choose three. That's what these numbers right here signify. 
the number of ways there are to choose um, zero things from three, or one thing from three things, or two things from three things, or three things from three things. Well, there's, there's just one way to choose zero things. Um, there's just one way to choose three things. If you've got, um, if you're gonna choose one thing from three things, let's call those th three things A, B, and C for the sake of discussion here, right? So if you're gonna choose one, you can either choose the set just with A, you can use the set just with B, you can choose the set just with C, right? Those are your three choose ones. Three choose two, well, you got, you got your AB, you could choose AC, or you could choose BC, right? So these are called the um, binomial coefficients, which is um, kind of funny, um, given why we call them binomial coefficients, but I'll, I'll tell you that that'll become clear as we go on. Um, but their significance to combinatorics is that um, n choose k is equal to the number of ways to choose k things from n. Um, and I think we have to say without, um, without, repeat, without repeats, right? Like I can't have aa or bb, you know? Um, okay, so the last, um, the last row here, right, this one, this is, let's see here, that's three, four, five, this is six. So like this says that this is six choose, six choose zero, six choose one, six choose two, six choose three, six choose four, six choose five, six choose six. You notice that there's a symmetry here between choosing one and choosing five or choosing two and choosing four, which is kind of interesting in and of its own right. Um, but yeah, there you go. Now these, this triangle that I'm drawing, of course, has a name. It's called Pascal's Triangle. Um, I usually introduce this to students in calculus. Um, sometimes I introduce it in pre-calculus, but that's probably just me misbehaving. No, I don't know. I think you could show this to students as soon as they, as soon as they run into the problem of, you know, like a plus b, say to the to the sixth power. Um, so the way the binomial theorem works is it says you do a to the sixth plus six a to the fifth b plus fifteen a to the fourth b squared plus 20, a cubed, b cubed, plus 15, a to the, well, two, b to the fourth, plus six, a, b to the fifth, plus uh, b to the sixth. And so, obviously, that is like colossally faster than actually foiling out a plus b to the sixth <laughs> brute force, right? And this, what I just used here, is called the binomial theorem. We're going to prove that result for um, arbitrary uh, n using induction. So that's where we're going, all right? So I probably should call this uh, 9.5. <laughs> Oops. Oh, well. I haven't scanned it yet, so. Here we go. So um, <clears throat> I'll get my cover sheet here. Lemma. n choose x. And so here's the formula for n choose x. n choose x is n factorial over x factorial times n minus x factorial. If you have that, then n choose x plus n choose x minus 1 is equal to n plus 1 choose x. That's actually how we just constructed. That was the rule for constructing the next, um, the next line on that Pascal's triangle, right? Um, although this formula really did not appear in my previous uh, page, right? Okay, so we start out here. Let's fix x, and we'll let pn be the statement that n choose x plus n choose x minus 1 is n plus 1 choose x. And it's going to be helpful to notice that 2 minus x factorial is 2 minus x times 1 minus x factorial, because that's the number, and that's the number less 1. So this is just the definition of factorial applied to the case n equals to 2 minus x. If n equals to 2 minus x, then n minus 1 is 1 minus x. Likewise, x factorial is x minus 1 factorial times x. All right, great. So 
looking at the inductive claim for, I need to show that P of one is true, right? So one choose X plus one choose X minus one is by our definition of N choose X up here, this plus that. And then one factorial is one, so I've got that, great. And then look what I've done here. I've, I've traded my one minus X factorial for two minus X over two minus X factorial. That's true if you just divide this to the other side. Uh, rather divide that to the other side, you get um, one over one minus x factorial. I'll write it in here, one over one minus x factorial is equal to um, two minus x over two minus x factorial, right? And this tells me that um, x over x factorial is equal to 1 over x minus 1 factorial. Maybe you remember these kind of calculations from calculus 2 when we were manipulating series. I don't know. Maybe you don't. But anyway, there they are. Um, and so that was cool because then doing that has given me a common denominator so I can add them. And when I add them, the x and the x, x and the minus x cancel. And I'm left with 2, which is actually 2 factorial, which, if you look at it, is actually 1 plus 1 choose x. Therefore, that's what I need to see that p of 1 is true. And that's for arbitrary x in the natural numbers. So, okay, there's my base case. And that's, um, you know, you might, you might have asked the question in class, can you give me an example of an inductive proof where the base case is not entirely trivial? Here you go. The base case actually was... <clears throat> A little bit complicated here, wasn't it? Now let's look at the inductive step. It's actually about the same difficulty. So if we suppose that this is true for n, and we consider n plus 1, then by the definition of the, the choose symbol that we gave in terms of um, quotients of factorials, we've got this and that. Um, but then, same trick as in the uh, base case, we'll rewrite that n plus 1 minus x as n plus 2 minus x factorial with n plus 2 minus x upstairs. So um, just to color code where things are going, this guy becomes this and that guy. And um, over here, this guy becomes this and that guy. The rest of it just rides along because you notice that the uh, minus one, minus and minus and minus one gives me plus one, so one plus one is two. Um, all right, great, now we've got a common denominator, and as such, we can put those things together when we do the x's cancel, and we're just left with n plus two times n plus one factorial, right? But this is, by definition, a factorial n plus two factorial over x factorial n plus 2 minus x, and that is exactly n plus 1 plus 1 choose x, which is what we needed to show in order to prove that pn plus 1 is true. Therefore, the lemma follows by proof by mathematical induction. Now, the reason I called this a lemma is because it's a result we're going to call for in an upcoming proof, all right? So let's go to it. Let's get to it. Here it is, the famed um, binomial theorem, uh, a plus b to the n power is the sum k equals 0 to n, n choose k a to the n minus k times b to the k, where n choose k is defined like so. All right, so, and this is true for all n, and, uh, and I'm assuming a and b are real numbers here, but in fact, um, this is true in a more general context than that, as you uh, may learn when you study ring theory and abstract algebra. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Let's just think of them as real numbers. A and B are real numbers. And um, <clears throat> just to um, expand on that briefly, the binomial theorem is not true for like matrices, right? If I have a matrix A plus a matrix B to the n power, it is no longer the case that <clears throat> the binomial theorem holds for general matrices A and B, even if they're square. Um, we would need that the matrices commute for this result to hold, but See, now I'm, now I'm digressing. All right, so our induction claim, induction statement rather, is that a plus b to the n is equal to that, right? 
And so first up, I will check that the base case is true. So the first power, a plus b to the 1, is a to the 1 plus b to the 1, which is 1 choose 0 times that plus 1 choose 1 times that, which is exactly what we want. So it, it holds for, for n equal to 1. That completes the base step for PMI. Next, we'll suppose that n is greater than 1 and assume inductively that the binomial theorem holds. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate um, what happens at n plus 1. All right, so here we go. a plus b to the n plus 1 is a plus b times uh, a plus b to the n, right? That's the definition of uh, exponent, basically. And then, so I'm going to say definition of a to the n plus 1 equals a to the n times a, although I, I, I really should maybe use, oh, here, I'll use a bar there. <laughs> you can think about a bar equal to a plus b if that helps, okay? Um, now here, this is by the induction hypothesis. Right, because we're trading a plus b to the n for the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k, a to the n minus k, b to the k. That is exactly what we know to be true um, by the induction, induction hypothesis. And um, then I do some algebra. Namely, I, I distribute the a in here. So we go n minus k plus 1. In the b case, this follows. And then b times that sum, I bring the b in. I get a to the n minus k times b to the k plus 1, like so. How do I know I can do that? I'm using the linearity that we proved for finite sums a little bit earlier. All right. <clears throat> so, great. Now what? Next, <clears throat> I peel off the n plus 1th term, um, well, rather the um, k equals 0 term in this sum to give me that. So notice that the k equals 0 to n, this is k equals 1 to n. So k equal to 0 gives me n plus a to the n plus 1. See, a to the n minus 0 plus 1 is a to the n plus 1. b to the 0 is 1. So that's that. Then from this guy, at the top, when we get to n, we get a to the n minus n, which is 0, and b to the n plus 1. So the, 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 the last term in this sum is exactly b to the n plus 1. Um, and then I have what's left over, right? Um, now, to go to the next line, I make a, a shift. Um, I, I see, because I want to make these sums match up so I can add them together. And notice this one starts at 0 and that one starts at, at, at 1. So I make them both start at, I make the, the second one start at 1 by making a, a, a change of variables, a shift of indices, if you will. And in particular, I say k is equal to j minus 1. And if I do that, when when um, when k is equal to 0, then 0 is equal to j minus 1, which is to say that j is equal to 1. And when k is equal to n, that means, um, when, rather, when, when k is equal to n minus 1, that suggests that j is equal to n. So we have to change the bounds when we shift the indices, just like when we do u substitution and we change the uh, variable integration, we have to change the bounds. Um, same with the sums. And... Um, so then, uh, of course, the k becomes j minus 1, and, um, you know, k plus 1 is j, so there's that. And um, once I have that, then I can combine the sums. Um, I can just switch this one. I think of them both as a sum k equals 1 to n. So swapping indices, uh, once again, putting j equal to k to go down here. I've got n choose k, n choose k minus 1, and... Um, Notice that these and that are in fact the same. A n plus one minus k, b to the k. And once I, <coughs> excuse me, switch j to k, to go down here, I've got n minus k minus one and b to the k. So I have that, right? Great. And now we'll continue. <laughs> this one's a little bit long. So continuing uh, <clears throat> from the lemma, we know that n choose k plus n choose k minus one is n plus 1 choose k, right? And um, sometimes I just write a divide, like a fraction symbol there, and I just can't help myself. I'm going to get rid of it. There we go. 
a bad, bad habit. Um, and so we find, continuing our calculation from the previous page, that, you know, um, let me bring it back here for a second. So what I just did was shift it down here. Ah. All right, so we had this, but I know that this plus this is that, right? So um, I'm still not sure what to pay for it. Um, this plus this, but by the lemma, I know that I can write n choose k plus n choose k minus 1 as n plus 1 choose k, so I just change to that, right? Okay, and continuing here. All right, so that. But then I can put this and that back into the sum. Um, this gives me the k equals to 0. And that gives me the k equals to n plus 1. So notice that the sum goes 0 to n plus 1 on the next line. I've incorporated these two terms back into the sum again. And that's exactly what I needed. This is the binomial theorem for n plus 1. So we've shown that pn implies pn plus 1. And therefore we conclude by a proof by mathematical induction that the binomial theorem holds for, and this formula holds for arbitrary uh, natural numbers. So just a short remark. Typically, we don't say pn is the statement when giving induction proofs in mathematics. I'm doing that here to emphasize that the logical dependence of the proof, to emphasize the logical dependence of the proof on the statement. A typical proof would instead read like the following: Show a plus b to the n is equal to the sum k equals zero to an n of n choose k a n minus k b to the k for all n and n by an induction on n. Observe, you know, the base case. Hence, n equals one holds true. Suppose inductively that for some n greater than 1 and consider. So you notice that in this way of writing, there is no mention of pn. Rather, you just state the thing that you're inducting on, or you might just say by induction on n. Uh, my, my point, I just wanted, you know, wanted to tell you that, you know, if you go looking for people to announce what their inductive statement is, when you actually read proofs written, um, you know, in journal articles or even textbooks, <clears throat> you're not likely to find it, honestly. The place where you typically find explicit mention of the um, induction hypothesis is when people are first introducing induction, which is why I'm doing it here. Um, I just want to warn you, it's not actually the mathematical custom when we sort of uh, write big boy, uh, big, big girl proofs. <laughs> so whatever you want to say about it. Um, I guess you could just say people get sloppy, and, and you'd probably be right, but um, it's usually for a good cause, which is um, making the communication more clear. Um, Anyway, anyway, uh, another claim. Well, actually, this is one we already did. 7 to the n minus 2 to the n is divisible by 5 for all n. I just wanted to I want to circle back to this one and show you how much easier. Well, you can almost give a direct proof of it using the binomial theorem. So 7 is 5 plus 2. Um, let me say it this way. We can derive why that's true with the binomial theorem. Here's how I would derive it. Um, 7 to the n is equal to, because 7 is 5 plus 2, it's equal to that by the binomial theorem. But if you peel off the, um, the nth term, we get sum k equals 0 to n minus 1 of n choose k, 5 to the n minus k, 2 to the k, plus 2 to the n. So if I subtract that to the other side, I've got exactly what we're claiming about. So 7 minus 2 to the n is equal to this sum. And the thing is, I can, I can factor 5 out of this, like so, and then what I have left over is a uh, natural number because you can easily prove down here that, in fact, if we have k ranging from 0 to n minus 1, then that means that n minus k minus 1 is, is not negative, which is to say that 5 to that power is actually an integer. So you're taking a sum of products of integers, which is again an integer, which is to say that m is a natural number, which is to say that 7 to the n minus 2 to the n is a multiple of 5, which is what we were trying to prove. So you notice here that I didn't use induction, right? And yet I make a claim for all n, because if you can show that the formula holds for arbitrary n, you, don't, you might not need induction, right? And you could say, well, that's kind of illusory, because you used induction to prove the binomial theorem, and that was really the, uh, the critical step in this calculation. And you're right. You're right. Um, you know, binomial theorem is based on induction, and I did use the binomial theorem right there. 
But anyway, just to, just to mention, it is possible that we can prove things for all natural numbers without explicit induction. Sometimes the induction is implicit. It's hidden through some theorem or something. Anyway, the binomial theorem is certainly a non-trivial result, and I, I hope you appreciate me showing it to you rather than making it a homework problem. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes. So a couple of other. Um, we still need to talk about strong induction and the well-ordering principle, so let's get to it. But before I get to that, actually, one other thing, um, and this is from, uh, this is Theorem 1.8 on page 11 of uh, Joseph Rotman's Journey into Mathematics and Introduction to Proofs, which is available by Dover. Um, I'm not suggesting you get that book. It's, it's kind of a, um, a scenic tour of interesting tidbits of mathematics. It's, it would be a good textbook for this course, but it does have a lot of, a lot of gems, and uh, Rotman is one of my favorite mathematical authors. So anyway, here's, here's what he says. This is interesting for us because this is an example of an induction proof, um, which doesn't start at one, it starts at five actually. So we can prove the base step of five by you know checking two to the fifth is 32. 32 is greater than 25, which is five squared. So P5 is true. And um, so you know, all I'm saying is that we, we've been looking at inductions that start at one we could also start induction at some other um, other number. In fact, you could start induction at a negative number as long as you have that induction step. You know, you can still um, you can still prove it for for all numbers beyond that starting point. And um, for what it's worth, you could also talk about induction arguments which ran the other way. You could have a top number and run the induction to the left, like that's been done. Um, I, th I I think I was I think Cauchy did that and. 200 years ago? I don't know. I mean, it, it, it makes sense. You, uh, there's a lot of intuitive modifications we could think about for induction. Um, but anyway, um, suppose inductively then that 2 to the n is greater than n squared for some n greater than 5. And let us examine. Uh, let us examine. Sorry, let me keep my things in frame here. 2 to the n plus 1 is 2 times 2 to the n, which, by the way, is greater than 2n squared, right? By the induction hypothesis, right? 2 to the n is greater than n squared. Hypothesis. All right, but notice that if, 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 if we did know that 2n squared was greater than n plus 1 squared for n greater than 5, then we would be done, because that would show that 2 to the n plus 1 is greater than n plus 1 squared, which is the induction hypoth, which is the inductive claim for n plus 1. All right, so let's try to prove that. Um, so here's the proof of that. Consider n greater than 5. Notice that 2n squared is, is, is greater than n plus 1 squared um, equal to this is a statement. Notice if this is true, that's true if and only if that's true. In other words, I can subtract um, n squared to the other side and, and uh, an equivalent uh, n, n, <laughs> n equivalent inequality to this is that. But n squared is n times n, which is greater than 3n, because remember, n is greater than 5, and 5 is greater than 3. So certainly n is greater than 3. So I can trade the n for a 3, and 3n is equal to um, <laughs> 2, 2n. Um, well, that's not equals 2. That's I traded an n for 1. I think I probably need a less than or equal to. I, probably, I could put a strict greater than there, actually, rather. So anyway, um, that gives us the n squared is greater than 2n plus 1. And so, by arguments above, we get that 2n uh, By arguments above, we've shown that pn is true, implies pn plus 1 true. And it follows that 2 to the n is greater than n squared for all n greater than 5, which are natural numbers. So there's an example of starting at not one. And finally, last not least, well, excuse me, almost last. The last is the well-ordering principle. Actually, to end this lecture, I have something more disturbing. 
but um, anyway, here's how strong induction works. Um, you have some inductive set. You want to show that 1 is in the inductive set. And then for all n greater than 1, you show that if you have 1 through n, you get n plus 1. All right. In other words, first show that the proposition is true for 1. Then assume that the proposition is true for all um, values from 1 all the way up to n. And then you want to get from that data that n plus 1 is true. And then if you can do that, then you can conclude by proof by complete induction and complete induction that um, the induction, uh, that this inductive statement is true for all n. Um, how is this different than proof by mathematical induction? Well, the difference is that in PMI, the induction hypothesis is assumed for a fixed but at arbitrary n greater than 1, whereas for proof by complete induction, aka strong induction, we show p of 1 is true, and then we suppose that p1 through pn are all true implies, uh, you know, we want, and well, I guess if we, sorry, and suppose all true. I guess what I had to before was right to show, eh, fine, I don't know, I, I guess I go back to to show pn plus 1 also true. All right, anyway, here's an example. Um, let s be the set of natural numbers. First of all, I'm going to set n greater than 1. Um, and um, actually here, it's a mod. <laughs> this is actually already a, a uh, strong induction which starts at 2. <laughs> so I'm, I'm already abusing um, what I said right above there a little bit and starting at 2 rather than 1. I hope that won't be confusing. Um, I think the next page I have a, a strong induction which starts at 1, so just, just bear with me here. So <clears throat> if S is the set of natural numbers such that n has a prime factor and n is positive, I mean, n is greater than 1 rather, first of all, observe that 2 is an element of s because 2 is a factor of 2, right? 2 is 2 times 1, so 2 is a prime factor of 2, which means that 2 is in this set. All right, again, the set of n in the natural numbers such that n has a prime factor, all right? Now, suppose that 2, 3, da, 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 n is in this set, and let's consider n plus 1, all right? Now, first of all, if n plus 1 is prime, then we're done, because n plus 1 is its own prime factor, and therefore n plus 1 is an s. All right. Otherwise, n plus 1 is composite, which means that there exist a and b, both not equal to 1, such that n plus 1 is equal to a times b. And clearly, um, a and b are less than n, given that n plus 1 is equal to a, b, right? Um, so if that's the case, then it must be that a and b both have prime factor, which means that n plus 1 equal to ab also has that prime factor, right? Um, so n plus 1 is an s, which concludes that, um, you know, the inductive set is the whole natural numbers with 1 removed by proof by complete induction. Now, um, that you know, star, I, I, I said clearly, right? Well, is it clear? Eh, I guess a little bit, but here's the details. Um, suppose a is greater than n, then n plus 1 equals to uh, ab, right, by our construction, and that's greater than um, bn, because remember, a is greater than n, and that implies that bn uh, or nb minus n is less than 1, all right, by that. And that implies that n times b minus 1 is less than 1. But the thing is that b is a natural number, and b is not equal to 1. So b is greater than 1, and b minus 1 is greater than 0. So the idea that um, a natural number times another natural number be less than 1, well, that's absurd, right? So. That's a contradiction which shows, to, which shows you that it must be the case that, um, you know, um, A and B both must both be less than N because I, I supposed otherwise. I supposed that A was, um, uh, we already know they're not equal to N, I think. But I could, I could maybe just be sure here. Let me put greater than or equal to be logical. Da, 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 da. Uh, I 
guess I, that changes this to greater than or equal to, which changes this to less than or equal to.